Hello everyone and welcome to this evening's webinar with the Southern Branch. We're here with our technical lead, Joe Hart today, and he's going to be talking to us about design fires and the relevance of fire testing in designing and managing buildings. Uh, as always, I'd like to remind you that everything in the presentation is the opinion of the presenter and not of the IFE. Please put your questions in the chat. I will work through the chat at the end and ask all the questions to Joe on your behalf. If I could ask you to keep your microphones and cameras off, as, as Dean said. Um, please don't put your hands up because it's a little bit difficult to find the hand uh, through the numbers of people. Any issues you have with sound or picture, try logging out and back in again. OK, Joe, I'll hand it over to you. Brilliant. Thank you, Dana. I uh, appreciate that. So if I share screen, hopefully you can just see the PowerPoint presentation now. Is that working? Yeah, that's perfect. Thank you. Great, then I'll crack on. Thank you uh, very much. So thank you everyone for dialing in uh, this evening. As, as we said just there, my name is Joe Hart. I'm the technical lead of the IFE Southern Branch, and I have another couple of roles that I'll tell you about at the beginning. The title of this presentation is uh, Design Fires, and the kind of subtitle is the application of fire testing in fire engineering design. We'll come on to that and, and the importance of that uh, yeah. as we progress through the presentation. So just to very briefly introduce who I am, as I say, I'm the technical lead at the IFE Southern Branch. So I do four of these presentations uh, a year. They're all free to attend. They're all recorded. Thank you for dialing in. If you're watching this later, um, please do feel free to get in touch with with any questions. Mike on the details are on screen. So first of all, I well, I have two roles, actually. So I'm lecturer in fire engineering at the University of Central Lancashire. That's where I am right now. I'm in my Preston uh, office here on campus. I've been teaching this morning. Some of you that have dialed in had a lecture with me at 10 o'clock this morning. That lecture was this presentation. All I've done is cross out UCLan and write Delta Fire Engineering on it. So uh, thank you for dialing in again. You clearly enjoyed it so much this morning. My, my other role is I'm a fire engineer. So I'm the director and founder of Delta Fire Engineering. So I spend about half my time here on campus where I teach fire engineering modules and do some research into industry related uh, things. And I also spend half my time Roughly, it's about five days each at the moment, but uh, I spend that time out in industry working on fire strategies, risk assessments, fire safety management, etc. If you do want to get in touch after the presentation, my details are there. I'm pretty good on the emails normally, so, so do feel free. I'm going to start by talking about this slide, though. So anyone that's ever been to a talk from me before, this will be familiar. I talk about this quite a lot. I'm doing a piece of work at the moment where we're trying to do some science communication it's called i don't particularly like that term but we're working in this field we're trying to get fire engineering out there as this multidisciplinary area that that it is that i certainly believe that it is um but fire engineering draws on lots of different disciplines and it's useful for us as engineers and students and, and academics to draw from these disciplines today's lecture specifically draws on the principles of chemistry biology and physics and i did a careers event a, a few months ago over in down in london uh, for some STEM, uh, some STEM work, and somebody told me afterwards that it's a rare discipline that draws on chemistry, biology, and physics, all the kind of three primary sciences. And I was quite proud to say that fire definitely does. We've got chemistry in the principles of fire and combustion. We've got biology in the human effects uh, of of fire, and physics in things like fluid dynamics, how fires grow and how fires spread. So we're going to draw a little bit on those three uh, in this evening's webinar. Now, nothing too crazy this evening. I'll say again, I did this presentation this morning. I did it for the final year students, so year three. This presentation sits in the program at, uh, what's the module called? So fire protection engineering, FV3002, and also enclosure fire dynamics. So we're kind of final year undergraduate level of content here. Nothing too technical, um, but a little bit of content that's hopefully useful for us. So I'm going to start by talking about this principle of A set, R set, which is a methodology we use when we design and, and risk assess buildings. And it's going to set up what we come on to later to do with fire testing. So A set, R set is a methodology that we use. It uh, consists of two things, A set and R set. Each one is an acronym, the available safe escape time and the required safe escape time. It's something that we use when we're assessing means of escape from a building. Ultimately, when we're trying to design a building, we are looking to ensure that people can get out of that building before untenable conditions arise. So we want to make sure that people aren't exposed to conditions that either make that either don't allow them to evacuate any further or prevents them in other way, some some other way getting out of the building. So this methodology is something that we use. So to go through them very, very briefly, the required safe escape time is made up of lots of different components. So we've got the detection time, the alarm time, recognition, response and travel. And the available safe escape time is what we're really going to talk about today. So I'll just quickly talk through the R set. 
So the R set is the required time. In essence, at its absolute fundamental definition, it's the time it takes from a fire starting to people getting to a place of safety. So we calculate this when we're doing a fire engineered solution. We start with working out how long it'll take for the fire to be detected, and then how long it'll take for occupants to become alerted to that fire once it is detected. Then any pre-movement time, which is the activities people do before they start to physically move, and then the travel time, which is the actual time it takes for them to start moving to get to a place of safety. And then what we're going to talk about this evening is the available safe escape time. Now the R set, the previous one we've just done, we can calculate by adding up all of those different components. We can work out how long it takes for a fire alarm system to detect a fire, or a fire detection system to detect a fire, sorry. We can then in instigate whether there is a delay between that detection occurring and the alarm going off. We've got some data, not a huge amount of data, but we have some data about how long it takes people to respond. And then we can work out distances and how long it takes people to travel those distances. So we can make a reasonable estimation of the R set time for a building. But A set slightly more difficult. A set isn't broken down into these sub components. Essentially, the A set is met at any point that we have untenable conditions. So in a building or a compartment, an enclosure, we have a time at which people are unable to continue to make their escape based on tenability criteria. We've got lots of these things. It could be because the toxicity levels are too high. It could be because the temperature is too high, the pressure, the visibility is too low, whatever it might be. Based on these conditions, if people can no longer escape, that's the A set time. And the thing that we try to do when we do this type of assessment is we compare the two times. We work out at its absolute core how long it takes people to get out of a building. We compare that with the conditions at that time. If they're still tenable and we have a, mar a margin of safety in there as well, then we have met the means of escape criteria. If it's that, if it's the fact that once people have got to the stage where they're still within the building, still making their escape, that conditions are untenable, we haven't met the ASAT answer. The means of escape doesn't work. We need to try and design that differently. And then we have two options available to us. We put things into the building to try and either increase the ASAT, so to make it so the building is safer for longer, or reduce the R set, make it so people can escape a bit quicker. So it feels a bit technical at this point, but really the, the point of A set, R set is, and the reason I want to talk about it, and the reason I, I talk about it a lot is, I realized something quite fundamental recently when I was talking actually to a student, which is that very often when I'm doing a fire engineer, doing a fire strategy, I document an A set, R set assessment. I might do some modeling to work out the conditions in the building, and then I write a big long report documenting the R set as well. And that is an ASET asset assessment as part of performance based design. But actually, the principle of ASET asset is something that I do every time I think about a fire engineered solution or I do a fire risk assessment. So when I'm designing or risk assessing a building, I apply the principle without knowing that it's what I'm doing. So if I'm reviewing a set of building plans and I'm reviewing against a guidance document like approved document B, for example, the first thing I'm looking for is compliance. If it meets the guidance, then I know I can write that up and assess whether that's suitable. But if I find non-compliant areas, I have to then do a fire engineered solution. I have to do some fire engineering. And the way that I do that, the methodology I realized, because actually a student told me it's what I was doing. It was a nice, uh, a nice moment where the teacher became the student. They told me that what I was doing was I was looking to see which, in, which was being impacted. So as an example, if I have an extended travel distance in the building, what is actually happening is that the R set is increased. It's taking people longer than the code permits me to get out of the building. So what I then look to do when I'm developing that solution is either reduce the R set somewhere else, reduce the detection time maybe by putting extra detectors in, or increasing the A set, trying to make the building safer for longer because I accept people are in the building for slightly longer. This particular student who are, uh, may be dialed in, I'm not sure, they're doing their dissertation on R set uh, principles. We're doing some work with virtual reality goggles, trying to work out decision-making time in, um, under a, an R set assessment. Um, and it was interesting for them to point out to me that the A set R set principle is something we use when we don't even realize that it's what we're doing. Because when we develop fire engineered solutions, for example, a couple of examples here, we put a fire alarm detection system into a building. What we're actually doing is we're looking to reduce the time it takes people to get out of that building. So a fire alarm detection system that we put in has no bearing on the A set for the building. It doesn't make that building any safer. It doesn't. Um, it doesn't make the conditions any more tenable by putting a system in there. What it actually does is it reduces the time it takes for people to get out of that building. So that is a mitigation against something like an extended travel distance. We're reducing the time it takes to alert people, which gives them slightly longer to be able to travel out of the building. 
Whereas if we put something like an automatic water fire suppression system in, a sprinkler or a water mist, that doesn't necessarily have an impact on how long it takes people to get out of the building. You could argue that it's also a detector, but for the purposes of this, it's 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 intended to make conditions more tenable for longer. An automatic fire suppression system increases the ASET. It makes it safer to remain in that building for longer, which offsets the idea that we have people in the building for slightly longer than, than they ought to be under the, under the prescriptive guidance. And then another example of this would be compartmentation. And this is one that I was talking about this morning and I was talking about quite a lot this week uh, in another session I was giving. The most boring uh, image in the presentation, this one, just a picture of a, a blank wall. But what it's intended to, to represent is just fire resistant construction. So just a compartment wall. If we have a wall in a building and we upgrade that to achieve a certain fire resistance, we're doing actually in this instance, both increasing ASET and reducing RSET. So what we're doing by putting compartmentation in a building, breaking that building up into smaller fire compartments. We're making it so that the potential fire is smaller. We're containing it to a single compartment. We're reducing the amount of fuel available to that fire. So we're increasing the ASET. We're making it so people can remain in the building for longer. But if we design the building correctly and we have a strong fire strategy and we think about it logically, we can also reduce the time it takes people to reach a place of safety. Because if somebody passes that compartment boundary, they are in a place of relative safety, remote from the effects of the fire. So we can use compartmentation very, very heavily to both increase the ASET whilst also reducing the RSET. And this sets up the next part of the presentation. So compartmentation generally is passive in brackets active because we can actually have active, active uh, compartmentation as well. But it's a fire barrier. It's a protection that provides a barrier against fire growth. And in bold, because it's important for the next bit of the presentation, it's measured in a period of minutes. So we have fire doors and compartment walls that are 30 minutes, 60 minutes, 90 minutes, 120, 240 minutes. That's the way that we measure these and that we grade these elements of passive fire protection in buildings. And to kind of tie back to the ASET RSET thing, compartmentation is one of those things that is a really key fire engineered solution, partly because it's relatively easy to do. If you put a wall in anyway, it's not a difficult conversation to have to upgrade that to become fire rated. It's certainly easier than saying we need to put something in here like a sprinkler system where one isn't otherwise proposed. So as a fire engineer, when I've got my professional hat on, I rely on compartmentation quite heavily in my fire engineered solutions. So moving on to, again, nothing too crazy in terms of theory, the stages of the fire. This is very first year undergraduate level, probably even A level standard, to be honest with you, the, the stages of a fire. So let's bring in some theory here. When we think about a fire, we think about a fire happening over a period of time. It's not locked in time. We can look at something and say the heat release rate at that point in the fire at 60 seconds was X. But when we plot a fire, we look at it over a period of time. And we plot this over a graph and we call this a temporal graph. A fire is a temporal event that occurs. It has a start, it has an end, and we plot it over a period of time. And the image on screen there is a fairly standard fire curve graph. So we've got time plotted along the uh, bottom there. And up the side, we've got some aspect of that fire, whether it be temperature, heat release rate, toxicity, even whatever it might be, we're plotting it against time. And when we do that, we get in this example, a nice linear curve, a nice standard curve. So we've got an incipient phase, we've got ignition, first of all, an incipient phase, a growth phase, at some point flashover will occur if the fire is left to, to its own devices, and that's the transition to the fully developed fire. And then the final stage is decay or extinguishment. So the very kind of simplistic way of plotting a fire on a graph is like this. We've got this nice smooth uh, bell curve in this instance and these fairly standardized stages of ignition, growth, fully developed and then a decay phase as well. But I use the word there, I think idealized because that's exactly what it is. Fires are very, very difficult to predict. They don't behave in a predictable way. I was having this discussion with some of the committee members just before this presentation about how easy it is to predict a fire and the answer is it's not very easy at all there are just too many variables if i in my office as i'm sat here now set the same fire twice and i challenge anyone to do this and i've done it myself not set fire to this office but done this experiment where you set up the exact same rig and set the fire in the same way say it's a sofa you have two comparable sofas exactly the same set fire to each one they will burn very very differently the conditions in that environment will be very different because there are just so many variables involved in the growth stage of a fire. So it makes it very, very difficult for us as engineers and academics, researchers, whatever we might be doing to predict that graph, to draw that graph with any real accuracy of what will happen in a real fire. But 
there are times when we need to do that. There are engineered solutions, there are research elements, fire testing, the one we'll come on to, relies on having some understanding of a design fire, making some prediction. And it's our role in working in fire to make those predictions, to come up with a design fire that's reasonable for the case that we are working on, whatever that might be at the time. And we talk about this, I'll go through these in a little bit quick, but there are three different factors that feed into um, this development of a fire, this, this design fire concept. And these are different variables that can impact the way that the fire grows and reaches its full, uh, fully developed stage. So the first of these three are the fire characteristics themselves. So what is happening in the fire? This is the chemistry bit. Remember my first fire diagram, the chemistry of it. So that will alter based off the fuel source. So what it is that's actually ignited. If you've got multiple different fuel sources in a room, it's what is burning at that particular time. The ignition source as well will change how rapidly the fire grows and how likely it is to spread. Toxic yield, I was talking about this earlier in the lecture and I quite liked the, what I said. Uh, I know that sounds very uh, kind of arrogant, but the way that I described it was, if we have a chair that's burning and that's got some plastic and then it's got a layer of, of foam and then the outer material, it's very unlikely that those materials will burn at the exact same rate if we repeat the test two or three times. The outer material will burn at a certain rate and then ignite the foam, but that won't necessarily be the exact same time in each time we run the test. So the way in which the uh, fuel package itself burns and reduces may well be different each time. So we need to make some assumption that is a variable that is key, as is availability of oxygen. The second of these things that really impacts the way that a fire grows is the building characteristics itself. So the environment in which we have set this fire. I picked a bit photograph an atrium. Uh, I don't know where that is. It's just a generic one, but it's the it's the one that comes to mind. A fire in an atrium behaves very, very differently to a fire in an external space or in a compartment. First of all, the contents are very different. The ambient conditions differ. The ventilation rates that come into a somewhere like an atrium is very different. All of these factors feed into the way that that fire will grow. So if we're trying to think of a design fire, we're trying to plot a fire uh, and kind of make predictions about it, we have to be cognizant of these building characteristics. Any compartmentation in there, the geometry of the building, even the use of the building. Lots of buildings have transient fire loads. They change over time. Uh, so we need to be cognizant of those, those when we're trying to predict what that fire might look like. And the third of these are the occupants. Uh, I always use a picture of King's Cross here. There it is looking nice and quiet as it always is. Um, who's in the building? So if we're designing for life safety, which is ultimately what we're doing, and we're thinking about how that fire might grow, we have to be cognizant of the people that are there. Firstly, how are they going to evacuate? If we're doing something like an RSET assessment, we've got to think about how quickly they're going to react and how able they are to get out of the building. But also how well trained are they? How much awareness do they have? If you have a fire in a space that's very, very uh, well managed and everybody there has got a lot of training and fire awareness and intervention, the fire may well never reach fully developed because someone's going to put the fire out. So if you but then if you've got a space where people are unable to escape, um, that's going to very much impact again the way that that fire plays out. So when we're developing these design fires, we have to be cognizant of all of these these three factors, the fire itself, the building and the occupants we have there. So I've said now that it's very important for us to be able to do this as, as designers and engineers and, and researchers. So how do we go about doing it? How do we make predictions of the thing we've just accepted is very difficult to do? Well, there are a number of different things available to us. We can do numerical analysis. So if I were to do this in my office here on, on campus, I could in theory add up all the combustible material in the room, take the weight of those things, multiply it by the calorific value and work out the kind of peak heat release of the fire in this room. I might struggle to come up with the growth phase and you know, kind of predict how, it, how that fire would grow. What I might do actually is skip to bullet point three and take some probabilistic risk analysis. So I might say probabilistically that desk will ignite once this desk reaches a certain level. So then I can start to try and map that. I'm developing a curve there. I'm developing a kind of design fire as I'm going. It's a bit long winded, but it is a way of doing it. I can also look at historical data. So we're doing some work on that at, at UCLan here at UCLan at the moment into fire investigation where you take a room where there has been a fire, you add up what didn't burn, and then you start to make some assumptions about why it didn't burn and, and, and why it did. An example that I'm aware of from a, a fire investigation I was reading uh, a while ago was there was a fire in a stair and it was found that the emergency lighting had melted. So we knew then, or that the investigators knew that the fire within that stair was a certain temperature because they knew the conditions that would cause that emergency lighting to melt. So by looking kind of historically, often in a fire investigation uh, technique, you can start to make assumptions about what the design fire must have been. 
also if you've got footage, CCTV footage, things like that, you can look at the way that the fire grew, which is very, very useful. Any data you've got in there that, that might help you do that, you can use historically. Or we'll use fire test data, and this is perhaps the most prevalent. The, the image on screen on the left hand side there is the design fires for use in fire safety engineering. One of the key textbooks we use on the module I was teaching this morning where I gave this lecture. And a very useful resource, anything that, well, the clues in the title, isn't it? Design fires, it gives us some data that allows us to predict certain types of fire as they grow. Now, for anyone that's not familiar with this document, I do recommend you get hold of it if you're working in fire or you're studying or something like that. Two different types of data contained in here. First of all, commodity data and then room test data. Essentially, what this is, is it plots a graph for us of the design fire of that particular test. These were real uh, live scale tests done by the BRE and documented in there the very good description of what exactly the test conditions were and then a graph of each one so if we were designing something like we were designing a living room we could go in here and get some living room test data so looking at this we're not going into much depth here but we can say okay flashover occurred at around five megawatt so five thousand kilowatts we can see that the growth there was not very not much happened between six and a, up to six and a half minutes but then we had quite rapid growth spread so in four or five minutes we went from almost zero kilowatts all the way up to five megawatt so we can start to estimate if we were thinking about a living room design fire based off of this data what it looks like uh, in this particular test that was that took place we then get after flashover the fire dies down secondary ignition of the sideboard and we can see it was ex uh, ultimately extinguished so if we were looking for data that would be very useful for us to understand if we were then designing a prison cell which was the another room test that was done as part of that study we can look at that and say start to draw some comparisons so we can say at this stage the peak heat release albeit there was some intervention so we would look at that if we were doing this this piece of work uh, for, for real but we can say the prison cell reached a, a heat release rate that is half that of the living room two and a half megawatt 2500 kilowatt and that the growth rate was slightly slower it took slightly longer for it to reach that peak heat release rate but it ignited a bit quicker so when we're looking at design fires and we're trying to make this assumption because we have this duty to when we're doing some fire engineering we acknowledge it's very difficult but we can rely on some data and start to draw some correlations and think about the risks associated by comparing these different fuels to one another it, it is now november which means the festive season is nearly upon us which means everyone will soon be sharing the same video on linkedin that we all do every year of the christmas tree fires um, I include this one because this is part of the commodities test rather than the room test, but a very good uh, data here. Christmas trees, note please, if you will, that the uh, time here is in seconds, not in minutes. You can see that after 50 seconds, some of the, well, one particular sample there reached five megawatt, which is the same size as an entire living room fire. For anyone that doesn't know, Christmas trees, when you, these are live Christmas trees, you cut them down, they dry out, they're incredibly, uh, incredibly combustible. So again, if we were doing something where we were looking for Christmas tree data, we could look at this type of uh, data, develop a design fire and start to think about uh, what that fire might look like. So where would we use this? So in what scenario are we looking for a design fire are we establishing? Well, there's a couple of different ones. The first one is when we're doing some modeling. So computational fluid dynamics, CFD modeling is something a lot of us will be familiar with. Uh, certainly, if you come and study at UPlan, you become very familiar with it. Anyone in industry, you, you may have done a little bit. Some of us do do more than others. So CFD is a way of estimating the way that fluids move within a within a scenario. Um, it's not exclusive to fire. I was having this discussion this morning. In fact, that CFD, in fact, wasn't invented for fire. It's it's been used by us, but it's used in many different industries. The key one actually that it came from was predicting the weather down in the bottom left there when. You watch BBC News or whatever, and you get the ISA bars that come in. That's actually a CFD model that you're watching. Uh, but we do use this quite heavily in fire, and it's very, very useful for performance based design. And the key one of the key things we have to put into these models, we'll build a geometry of a building. We'll be trying to design an element of the building. For example, we want a smoke control system to extract smoke. So we put a fire in the building and see how it would spread. Now, the results of that model are very heavily based on the design fire that we put into it. The image on screen there is a graph that I plotted for a CFD piece of research that I was doing. I can't remember what it was. One megawatt looks like it's probably a sprinkler controlled flat to me based off that growth rate, 146 seconds, isn't it? So yeah, it's about right, T squared fire. So we put a design fire in and that's what the model predicts and allows us to do this piece of, uh, piece of engineering. But it is only as good as the information you put in. The model will just run the scenario that you put in you have to tell it the size of fire 
over that period of time that the model is running for. Some of the key input parameters, there are many of them, but some of the key ones are that peak heat release and the growth rates, the, uh, the, the kind of steepness almost of that curve as it gets to the heat release rate, uh, the peak heat release. And if we get this wrong when we put it into a model of, of a building that we're assessing, the results can be completely invalid. If you rerun the same model with slightly different parameters, you get completely different results. So we need to be really sure that we're assigning a suitable design fire based off of some of the analysis we're doing or having a good understanding of, of what it is that we're inputting and asking the model to solve for us. Here's an example of some of my research uh, that I've working on a few years ago. I've resurfaced it recently. I'm going to publish it soon of uh, a fire in an aircraft cabin during a during a flight. So in here, I had to be very, very careful and I've had to, I'm continuing to be very careful about what design fire it is that I'm choosing to use. I'm, I'm kind of adding up exactly what we would expect to be on an aircraft and how likely it is that that aircraft would grow, uh, the aircraft fire would grow, sorry, the ventilation condition coming from the air conditioning system, things like that. CFD is a very powerful tool that lots of us use, but we have to be cognizant that we're, we're being very, very careful um, of what conditions we're asking the model to solve for us. It's not all quite as fanciful as a uh, as an aircraft cabin, I'm sorry to say. A lot of the time we're using this to solve problems on building designs like residential corridors. So we're trying to work out what extract rate we need. Atria, I've already mentioned, and basements, basement car parks, things like that. We use these very advanced tools like the modeling. Um, but actually at the heart of them are these simple basics, which is we need to think about what fire it is that we're asking the model to solve for us. That's on us as the user to, to be... Um, Kind of confident in what we're assessing based off three parameters from the start which is the fire properties themselves the building geometry and the people that we're trying to protect so we actually have an obligation as designers and modelers and researchers to be very confident in the data that we're that we're putting into these models which brings us on actually to to the kind of last part of the presentation but but the most important is it is the the subtitle of the of the presentation, which is design fires in fire testing. So we've set up this idea of design fires and that they are very important. Fires are very difficult to predict, but we do need to, in certain circumstances, make those predictions. One of which is if we're doing advanced engineering, like our modeling. One of which is if we are doing a fire investigation, we need to try and predict what it was that occurred and why the damage was there. And another one is in fire testing. So fire testing is very, very important. And going all the way back to my very first slide about fire engineering and fire safety being multidisciplinary. This is an example of where I've kind of gone into a subfield of fire. Well, it's not a subfield, it's a kind of ancillary field of fire testing. Worked there for a bit. I've been doing some work through, through Delta in fire testing recently. Learned a bit about it that's actually made me a better fire engineer. It's one of those examples where you kind of work in a slightly different field and innovation comes sideways. You know, you think about something in a slightly different way. And fire testing is very important because we have, we'll specify things in the building. So we'll ask for a fire door to be a certain rating, a park wall to be a rating, and we need a way of standard, uh, a standard way of testing whether it achieves that, that rating so that we can get products to market, so that we can go out and buy something and be fairly confident it's been tested under that regime. So the way we do that is all these materials are tested against a design fire. So there has to be a design fire that is standardized across all these tests. That's in the interests of fairness. That's so that we know if I manufacture a fire door and I test it and get a certificate for 30 minutes, 60 minutes, whatever it might be, my competitors that are marketing a similar product have been through the exact same test regime. And that if I go off and buy those as a, as a client, an architect, a fire engineer, whatever it is, that the material I'm buying is robust enough to fulfill what I'm asking it to do. So the example that I use here, I always find useful in teaching to, to use an example alongside the theory I'm, I'm teaching. So in this example, I use fire doors under the national standard. We've been looking at, I've been looking a lot at BS476, and that's why it feeds into this, this presentation for some work in existing buildings. So fire doors would be tested under 476 in the, in the furnace that's pictured in, on the left-hand side there. So that is a furnace where you would attach on the on large hinged door that we've got going on there. We've, we've put the test samples, the doors themselves. Within the furnace, we've got um, on the next, no, on this slide still. Uh, within within that kind of chamber, we've got a furnace that is exposing that uh, material to a heating regime. They're exposed only from one side uh, because that replicates exactly what would happen in a real fire. And from that, we can determine a fire rating in a period of minutes. 
So the standard fire curve that they're tested to is this curve here, the ISO 834 curve. So it's a temporal curve. We used that term earlier. Temporal means plotted against time. You can see it's temperature versus time in this case. Every test that goes through this furnace is, plot, is uh, tested against the same heating regime in the interests of fairness, as we've just said. So we know that the results are comparable between two different products. So this particular curve is based on the burning rate materials found in typical buildings, it's sometimes called the cellulosic curve. It's based off cellulosic materials, a lot of them uh, being timber. It's quite an old piece of research. And the curve follows the particular formula that's given there. So T0 is the ambient temperature plus 345 log 10, 8T plus 1. So you can put that into an Excel spreadsheet, plot the graph, and it comes out exactly like that. Every test that uh, is carried out is plotted, uh, is subjected, sorry, to this exact same curve, exact same heating regime. And if we were looking to specify a fire door, so let's say that we're trying to make sure that we've got a 30 minute door, we're specifying that in terms of integrity. Now, just to briefly go over what this is, very familiar for, for some of us, I'm sure. When we talk about fire resistance, we have three methods of classifying. We have load bearing capacity, which is R. We have integrity, which is E, and insulation, which is I. So we can have a wall that is rated for all three of those things. There'll be a period of, of minutes, so it'll be 90 minutes integrity, 90 minutes insulation, 90 minutes load bearing. Or it may be only required that it's, if it's not a load bearing wall, it just needs 60 minutes integrity, 60 minutes insulation, all different kind of ways of classifying these things generally come from guidance that we're using for, to design the building. But fire doors only need to have the middle one, the E, the integrity insulate, uh, the integrity criteria. There's no need for a door to be low, to have a load bearing capacity. It's not a load bearing element. It moves, so it can't possibly hold the load. Nor does it have an insulation rating. The reason for that is because you assume that there is no load, no fire load directly next to a door. So the risk of there being um, a fire that's directly next to a door that's going to cause insu through insulation to spread. So the other side of the door is very low. We generally doors are used for transit, so we don't have fire load immediately next to them. So we would specify that we need a period of minutes in terms of integrity for a fire door. So let's say as a fire engineer, we're specifying that. We're saying we need 30 minute doors in this part of the building to enclose the stair or whatever it might be. So we go through a test, we take the sample, we put it onto the furnace. This is now the furnace seen from the front end. The furnace is, sits behind the doors. They're being exposed from the opposite side. That furnace itself incorporates burners fired by natural gas or LPG, and those burners are specified against that standard fire curve we looked at, the ISO 834 with that horrible little formula with the log 10 in it. So what it means is that every sample that's going through there is being exposed to the exact same heating condition, the exact same design fire in the interest of fairness. The test assembly itself um, is as per the final condition, so it should have the hinges on there, it's going to be used, the configuration, any hardware that's on there, the orientation. So you'll often test them from both sides simultaneously. It looks like it might, might be what's going on there. Um, so it has to be replicating exactly how it's going to be installed in a real building. And crucially for what we're talking about here, it's exposed to the exact same design fire as every other door that's being tested. The test is run, and then there are certain acceptance criteria. If these are met, then the door is deemed to have failed. I've put them on the screen there. So if sustained flaming is observed, is observed on the unexposed side, so if we were watching this, forget about the fact there's vision panels in there. If we could see flames coming through the door, it's failed that criteria. Two sides of gap gauges, a little six mil gap gauge and a 25 mil. If we can get them into any gaps that are forming around the door or any cracks that are formed, and either if it's a six mil gauge, move it around 150 mil, or if it's the larger gauge, if we can just get it into the furnace at all, it's failed. And the, the crucial thing with those is that if any of those three things occur, the test is stopped. The door has at that point failed. That's the point at which we suggest that uh, the test has ended. So it's, it, it's a fail at that point. And that happens at a certain time within the test. When that does happen, that's the test certificate is, is drawn up on, those, on that basis. If the door lasts 32 minutes, it gets a 30 minute rating. If it lasts 65 minutes, it gets a 60 minute rating. If it lasts 90 minutes, it's a 90 minute rating. So by going through this kind of standard test against the standard fire test curve, we get a rating for all of these materials. And this doesn't just apply to doors. I've used doors here just to, to give us some basis, but similar tests uh, exhibited for dampers, similar tests for compartment walls, fire stopping, anything we might put into a building that requires a rating. We use these kind of standard design fires that are standardized across all testing. But this is the kind of important consideration. And in, 
in, in academia, there are very few moments where when you speak to a group of students, there is a kind of collective light bulb that goes off. The, the students are too busy looking at their phones and talking to each other and eating bags of crisps to, to, to give us that kind of feedback. But occasionally you get a little light bulb moment and you realise a group of people have understood something at the same time. And it didn't happen this morning, but it's happened before when I've done this exact presentation at this element, this important consideration, because it is important. Um, the standard fire curve that's used, that 834 curve, is based on a certain type of materials and a certain growth rate and a certain peak heat release. And everything's tested against that because it's a standardised test. But what that test curve doesn't represent are the conditions that occur in a real fire. We've looked at some of the graphs earlier, that one for the prison cell, that one for the living room and the Christmas tree. Not only is it not a smooth curve, but if you run the test over and over again, I set the challenge earlier, if you keep running the test, you get a slightly different curve each time. So that standard fire curve isn't a real fire. It's intended to provide a standardised heating regime. It's not a prediction of real fire performance. So what that means is, I use the equal area principle to explain this, and hopefully there's the odd light bulb going off somewhere, and maybe somebody's twigged where I'm going with this. If we consider fire severity, we can measure it. There's multiple different ways, but one particular way we do this is by measuring what we call the area or the equal area. So it's the area under the graph that we've, that we've plotted. On that graph on the left, we look at TS, that line, and that's the standard fire curve. What happens is at a certain point, the material that we're testing will fail. And that's the dotted line that comes down to the, the bottom of the graph. Now, if we take the area, Underneath that graph, there's, an, there's a severity of the fire that that material has been exposed to. And if we plot another graph of a real fire and we match the two areas, what might not happen is it might not fail at the exact same time in a different fire that's not the standard fire curve. So TR on the graph just there is a completely different fire. I think it stands for test real. The R is for real. It grows a bit quicker, peaks a bit higher and then decays earlier. But you'll see that the areas under the graph are equal earlier than the standard fire test. Now, if we consider for a moment that that TR is a real fire that that material is exposed to, what that tells us or what that means is that that material will actually fail earlier than it did in the test. It may have survived 60 minutes in the test, but what might happen is in a real fire that grows a bit quicker, because we know it's very difficult to predict how a fire will grow, it might fail prior to 60 minutes under real fire conditions. And again, another graph that shows this, we've got fire A and fire B in this instance. We've got the standard fire in uh, the thick black line and two other fires A and B. One of them, fire A, is much like the previous slide. It grows a bit quicker, peaks higher and decays. Fire B grows slower and peaks lower than the standard fire test. Now, if we consider that we've got a material here, it's survived 60 minutes under the standard fire test. In a real fire that grows a bit quicker, it won't necessarily last for the full 60 minutes. What we're saying is that under the standard fire conditions, under the standard curve, that we have to use standardised under fire testing conditions, it lasts for a period of time. But in a real fire, it might last a lot. Uh, it might fail a lot earlier. Equally, if the fire isn't quite as severe as the standard design fire that we use under fire testing, it may actually last a lot longer. So in a fast growing fire, the material may fail earlier than 60 minutes. But in a slow growing fire, it may last much longer than 60 minutes. So what that tells us and why that's important for us to consider is relating it back to fire safety. So when we're doing fire engineering, when we're doing fire risk assessment, and we're assigning things in a building, we're saying a 30 minute door, 60 minute door. The thing that's really important for us to be kind of cognizant of is that that doesn't mean that it lasts for 30 minutes or 60 minutes in real life. That doesn't mean that that 30 minute door will last for 30 minutes in a real fire. It means it's lasted 30 minutes under standard test conditions against the standard fire curve. Similarly, a 60 minute compartment wall has lasted 60 minutes under standard conditions, but may not last 60 minutes in a real fire. So, Joe, why do we care? Why do you keep talking about this? Why, why are you telling us this? It's because I see it so often, this kind of miscommunication, this error. The, the examples on screen on the right hand side, the, the text there, they are real examples that I've taken from both my professional life and my academic life. These are things that I've read in um, I won't say exactly where they're from, but they're from student assignments or they're from fire strategy reports, other things that I've read. The top one there is from a consultant's report that I, well, 
I said I'm not going to say where they're from, and then I explained where, where exactly where they're from. But one of those is from a consultant's report that was I was peer reviewing. These are kind of misinterpretations that people write into to building strategies. The top one we can see after one minute, uh, sorry, after one hour, 50 minutes, a secondary alarm will activate to alert the fire service to leave the building. That was written into a fire strategy I was reading. Um, somebody had said there was a firefighting shaft that was two hours. If it got to one hour 50 and the fire wasn't out yet, the fire service would then evacuate. So applying the kind of principles that we're familiar with now that some of us would have known anyway, we know that that isn't true. The, the, those elements may have failed far earlier if the fire was more severe. Just because we've got a buildup that's lasted two hours in the standard fire test, doesn't mean we're safe for an hour and 50 minutes and then we need to leave. It may last far longer, it may last far shorter. Building users will be safe to remain in the building for up to one hour. Well, if we've quantified that in another way, then great. But if we're just relying on 60 minute doors and walls, that's not the case. It may be that the, the fire is more severe than that standard design fire we've used to test and, and classify, which means occupants are not safe for an hour. It is safe to remain in the building for up to two hours in a fire. I remember where I read that one, but I won't say it. Again, exact same principle. In that case, I've done it again. I've said I'm not going to say it, and now I'm going to tell the story. Somebody had said that it was a 90 minute uh, required in the building, but we're going to upgrade it to two hours to make sure because the RSET didn't quite work. It took longer than 90 minutes to evacuate the building. I questioned it because that doesn't quite work. It doesn't mean you've got two hours. It doesn't mean you're safe for one hour 59, but two hours and one, you, you, you're you dead. You know, you've got to be a little bit careful when people are specifying these things. And then the final one is one that I see, which is the ASET for the building is 90 minutes. We started the presentation by talking about ASET, RSET and how it's a very kind of complex engineering skill that we need to that we can apply in buildings that we see out there in industry. Um, it's a, and it's not quite as simple, unfortunately, as saying the A set is 90 minutes. It may be that we've got 90 minute structure. It may be we've got 90 minute uh, fire doors and walls. That doesn't mean that people are safe for 90 minutes. If we get a, a stronger fire, one that grows a bit quicker, higher peak re heat release rate than our standard test conditions, that material may well fail much earlier than 90 minutes. And I, but in the interest of fairness, I look at something on the left hand side and I understand, I get why people make this kind of misinterpretation. It's often people that don't work in fire. You read it and it says 30 minutes. This came from a, a manufacturer's website. I was just Googling fire doors for something. I, think I was actually buying some for, for a project and I went on the FAQ document and I read this and I've highlighted the two things. So one of the FAQs on there was what's the difference between FD30 and FD60 door. They've written on there, this manufacturer, that FD30 offers 30 minutes fire protection and is suitable for all domestic situations. FD60 offers 60 minute fire protection. There's a very literal interpretation of what the guidance is, and it's incorrect because an FD30 door, 30 minutes in a test, doesn't mean it offers 30 minutes protection. But if I didn't know about fire and I hadn't researched it and studied it a little bit, I might read that and think, well, that makes sense. It says 30 minutes, so I get 30 minutes. So if I'm sat behind a door, I've got 29 minutes in which I'm safe, and after that, it's going to start failing. Not actually the case as, as, as we've been through in this presentation and as we uh, as we hopefully hopefully now have a bit of an appreciation of. So that is the that's the kind of the end actually I've kind of related all of that information back into fire testing at the end but the the, the crucial thing that I do in this talk is about design fires. This idea that fires are very very difficult to predict we almost can't predict because as I've said a couple of times you take the exact same scenario run it twice you won't get the same results. Um, Design fires are a, a method of us estimating and predicting because in some circumstances we have to do that when we're working in fire. If we're running some advanced modeling, some CFD, we have to input a uh, design fire. And if we're doing fire testing, we have to have a design fire. We have to have a standardized way of testing materials. Otherwise, there's no comparison. But we also have to acknowledge with that last point that it's not what happens in a real fire, which means if we go for a 30 minute door, 30 minute wall, it doesn't necessarily give us that under real conditions. And then I just go back to this. I usually use this slide to bookend all my talks. I start and end with, I start by saying fire engineering is multidisciplinary and I finish by saying it does need to be as well. It is our kind of obligation, I think, to learn a little bit about these different fields. As I say, I've the more time I spend doing things ancillary to fire, the better fire engineer I become. So I encourage people generally to, to read around different subjects uh, out slightly outside. You can, in, in my opinion, I believe, over specialized. You can become too much of a specialist in one field, you forget about kind of everything else. So I encourage people to go off and, and read and do some work in other fields. So I'll finish. Actually, this is the book end, isn't it? This is the contact details, still the same. Um, so my name's Joe. I work part of my time working as a consultant, fire engineer, part of my time as a lecturer here at the university. 
there's no real divide between the two. I kind of do both all day long. So uh, feel free to email me on either of those if you've got got any questions or you want to chat about anything. The last one of these I did actually, I got loads of I got loads of stuff afterwards. I'm now doing a couple of research papers with people that got in touch, and I'm doing some work. So it's it's great when people do get in touch. So please do feel free. Uh, and that's me. So back to you, uh, Dana, if that's okay. Thank you. I've literally jotted down um, your statistics on the Christmas tree because I am gobsmacked that it's 50 seconds for it to reach the same heat output as the whole living room. I think that's a really good one to know over Christmas and to share. Um, I wanted to ask, have you got an opinion on how you think we can make this testing more realistic? Um, no, I, I agree that it ought to be standardised. and I don't disagree with the curve that we use. The only thing that I would do is if I knew that I was using something for a specific purpose. So if I was assigning something that's going to go on an oil rig, for example, I know I ought to use the hydrocarbon curve because it's more relevant. So I don't necessarily think the one that we use now is incorrect and we should change it. But I would be looking for something that's perhaps more relevant if I know I've got one application, if that makes sense. If I manufacture something that is only used for a certain environment, I'd probably be looking to change my design fire to be as per the final condition. OK, thank you. And when we're looking at like for me to predict a living room, I mean, my living room is probably very different to yours, different to my nan's, you know, different to a, a young person's. Um, how can you predict? And especially now, 2022, we've got mobility scooters, we've got the um, bikes, all these new components, Xbox, Playstations and things like that are all going to change. So is this something that's updated? we have time to take these things into consideration that change. Absolutely. I mean, it's something that ought to be. Um, a lot of this research, certainly the standard fire curve, goes back a very long time. It's based off of cellulosic materials, timber in people's homes. Nowadays, of course, we have even not, not even thinking about these e-scooters that keep going up everywhere, more plastics, more foam materials. There are kind of more refined methods that we can use to, to predict these. But I completely agree. Uh, Dana, my living room is probably very different to yours and very different to your nans again. So it is an estimation. It is a prediction. But there has to be this element of standardisation whilst we should all be cognizant that that isn't a real fire because the real fires can be very different in different environments. My living room, very different to your living room. But equally, two fires in my living room won't be exactly the same. So it is just a prediction. It's a way of kind of making it's a design fire. It's not a real fire. So, yeah, very good. Uh, very good point. Brilliant. All right. Thank you so much, Joe. And thank you, everyone, for coming and listening. We have recorded today. And Joe, you are happy uh, for that recording to be shared on the website. By all um, means. So yeah, please do. People can catch up. So thank you, everybody, and have a great evening.